Hello there. Welcome to the how to understand and support your child or adolescent with their screen use. I'm really thankful that you were able to take the time out of your busy day um, to watch this workshop. I hope it's really helpful for you. I always like to start with a land acknowledgement. I think it's super important that we take some time to think about um, our impact on the land in the past, um, but also today and in, into the future. Um, we know that colonialism is not just um, an event in the past, and so it's important for us to you know, reflect and respect the land that we're on. Um, so we here in the Durham region respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island. So my name is Kim Sundell. I'm one of the social workers here with Durham Catholic. Um, I feel very lucky to have been with the board uh, for as long as I have, and I've worked in many sites um, here at the board. I've worked in elementary schools and secondary schools, and so technology use and the impact on our kids is something um, that I've worked a lot with, and so I, I hope that um, you know my experience will be helpful um, for all of you today. Uh, here's the agenda for the workshop. So I wanted to start off with going over uh, some of the recent research Been lots of research into how often kids are using their phones and the impacts on their brain um, and their mental health. So I wanted to. I also wanted to talk about some ways that you can support your child or adolescent with their technology use. Technology is not all bad and it's probably not something that we can get away from. So I'm um, starting to focus on how we can be safe with it is uh, a really important priority. And also some resources um, that you can use or your kids can use to learn how to, you know, be safe and use tech um, to its fullest potential. Uh, I wanted to just give some credit to some of the sources that I used. So these are some of the um, resources that I look to um, to create this presentation. So I wanted to make sure that they got some credit. Uh, I wanted to start off with a quick video. This is a video of some teens who were interviewed about uh, technology use, um, really starting with the focus on how many hours in a day they thought they used it versus how many hours they actually did. And this is a, a video about teenagers, but probably a lot of us adults could be guilty of this as well. Um, uh, um, um, uh, probably like, probably <laughs> two or three hours a day. Four hours? Maybe like five hours total. I think I spend like five hours on my phone, probably about like eight hours a day. Eight hours a day on it because, you know, that's a school day. I don't feel like I spent a lot of time on it. I shouldn't be sending this much. Maybe. Should I look? Let's see. Oh, God. Yikes. Okay. Two hours and 58 minutes per day. Yeah, six hours. <laughs> and Snapchat's the most used. I did not expect that. Eight hours. Oh, nine hours. Nine hours per day. Like six hours. Spend nine hours on my phone. Because it's eight hours and 20 minutes a day. That's a <clears> lot. <throat> uh, last seven days, it says two hours per day. That's a little bit more than I thought. It says about six hours per day. Seven hours and 12 minutes per day. My seven day average is eight hours and 45 minutes per day. That's a lot. <laughs> That's quite a lot. Yeah, it's definitely more than I thought. But it is down 14% from last week. And I actually don't have my phone today because it's broken. You know, it's actually relaxing. I spend a lot of my time on my phone at school. It depends on the class. If we're not doing anything, there's not much to do at school. Like, I pay attention sometimes, but I'm usually looking at my phone. You have to try and not get caught. I've gotten in trouble at least two times in school for it. I should probably get up and do something. I only use Instagram now. I've stopped using Snapchat as of, like, January. I just found myself getting really anxious about things, so I decided, you know, I'll just take a break from social media. Like, I feel pressure to post, pressure for how many people like my pictures. I get to see them living their, you know, exotic lives. It's a lot of like, oh, I went to Italy. And you're like, oh, wow, wish I could go to Italy. But you know, sometimes that just takes a toll on you when you're like sitting in your room, just like binging Netflix all day. No one's going to put on when they fall or like when they're down. I don't tend to get anxiety so much as like jealous or I'll hear a video. And I'll think, oh, I wish I could sing like that. It's because it looks like what you're doing is not what you should be doing. Like you should be doing more. I definitely compare myself to other people on social media. I, you know, look at them and I'm like, Oh, why can't I look like that? I wish I looked like that. I'm like, oh, she's 
prettier or I love her hair. What can I do to get like that? Like, I wish I could look like that. How can I be as skinny as she is, as blonde as she is? You're always seeing just Instagram model after Instagram model with like these perfect bodies and always in little bitty bikinis and you're like, why don't I look like that? My brother like and his girlfriend, they're very supportive and everything. So like I'll talk to them and I'll be like, why can't I look like that? And they'll just be like, you're beautiful. Stop it. It doesn't matter however they look, because at the end of the day, you have to live in your own body and your own skin. They don't have to live in your skin. So love yourself and enjoy yourself. The best thing that anyone can ever remember is that you would never take a picture of yourself and post it at a low point. It's important that we remember that when we look at stuff like that. You could take it as a I will try to be as good as that person or I will try better. Most of the time, it motivates me to be more like them or better myself. Or you could take it as a negative thing and just decide to feel bad about it and get down on yourself. I just decided, you know, it's not healthy for me to be in that environment when I have the choice not to be. I have to, like, step back from it sometimes and just kind of be like, like, I'm my own person without social media and just kind of focus on, like, my actual friends. I think that that video, uh, it always reminds me a couple of things. First of all, how much our kids actually use their phones. For some of those kids, eight hours in a day, it, it still shocks me every time I see it because that's a lot of their day. And I think if you walk through a high school, it's not surprising. Phones, uh, even for adults, they become the way that we um, take care of any spare time. Um, waiting for a bus, standing in the hall, waiting for class, um, just constantly constantly uh, using that phone whenever we have a spare second. And so that is going to add up. Um, it also reminds me when I see that video about the, the change for our kids and what they're exposed to um, and how how big of a deal that is and um, being exposed to all of the images and even though they all know that they're uh, only posting at their highest not their lowest it's still what is flooding um, them at all times with likes and how many likes people have and what they're doing and where they're going um, and so you know we've got to watch the toll that that has um, so here's some stats. So these are Canadian stats. Um, so we know that over one third, so 35% of high school students spend more than five hours um, on their phones, their electronic devices in their free time. So that would be at home after school or even just in the halls or on their way home. Um, one in five students report uh, symptoms of moderate to serious problematic tech use. So that's posting something online that they wish they hadn't um, or cyberbullying that they experienced or witnessed. Um, so that's one in five. Um, for students in grade 10 to 12, 28.9%, uh, so one out of four, report texting and driving at least once in the past year. Um, and that's also probably a very scary stat um, because these drivers are just learning to drive, um, but they're also getting distracted with uh, potentially some texting and driving. 50% um, of teenagers say they feel addicted to their cell phones. Um, so if they don't have them, if they're not close by, if they don't have access, they feel um, kind of some symptoms um, that, that isn't comfortable for them. 78% um, of teenagers say they check their cell phones at least once an hour. 78%, um, so that's almost 80% of teenagers say they check their cell phones at least once an hour, and it's probably more than that. 72% um, of them say they feel they need to respond to text messages or notifications immediately. Um, so when you look at that stat, you can imagine how that feels to constantly feel um, that you need to respond right away, that you have to read it right away, respond right away constantly kind of being alert and um, ready to to act um, and how that kind of impacts their ability to stay calm and, and be more present. Um, excessive smartphone use and mental health is obviously something that so many of us are wondering and worried about. Um, and so they have done some research uh, into um, smartphone use and mental health. So um, Canadians who check their smartphones once per hour, and we know that um, a large percentage, almost 80% of teens say they do that, um, they're 44% uh, less likely to 
to report being satisfied with their relationships with friends when compared to others who don't. Um, I think that that makes sense when we think about, um, you know, what they're exposed to, how that affects them being present in conversations, um, and even just how they are comparing themselves to other people's lives um, and other people's relationships, and then how that spills into how they feel as far as their satisfaction in their own lives. 20% um, of Canadians who checked their phones hourly reported just fair or even poor mental health. Um, so, you know, that is obvious, right, that people who um, are checking their phones frequently aren't feeling as good about themselves or their health, mental health as others. Um, there have been multiple systemic reviews of studies across many countries. So you'll see here the UK, China, Germany, Japan, Finland, Israel, and the US. And they found that for young people, excessive smartphone use was associated with an increased risk of depression and anxiety, perceived high stress levels, poor sleep quality. Um, again, it's important to know that this shows a correlation, not a causation. So these um, studies did not say that smartphone use what caused these things, but that they were all kind of interconnected. Um, and we're going to get into some of the impact on the brain um, when people are using their smartphones, um, you know, excessively. And so you'll start to see how that could affect your mood, could affect your sleep, could affect your uh, stress levels and your stress hormones in your body. Um, so uh, a correlation, not a causation. Uh, social media use and self-image, another uh, concern, and there are some um, kind of explanations for how there's a connection between these two. Um, so social media sites we know um, offer, they call it micro boosts. Um, so as soon as someone receives a friend request or that they're liked or followed, there's kind of a micro boost of self-esteem. Um, and so while that's a good thing um, for people who aren't getting those micro boosts, um, or even the fact that they're micro boosts and not constant steady. No one can predict when the micro boost is going to happen. No one's in control of the micro boost. It just kind of happens whenever someone else likes or follows them. Um, over time, that can cause some difficulty for kids who are trying to um, learn about their best self or learn about kind of who they are and what they're good at. Um, there's also an impact from the increase of a hyper connection through social media. Um, so one of the things that we know is kids are hyper connected, constantly connected, um, constantly um, kind of accessing their phones and ask, accessing social media. And what that means is that they are know that people are also hyper connected to their phones and devices. So when they uh, reach out to someone, when they text someone, um, they're really aware of whether someone answers them back and the delay that it takes for someone to answer them back because they know that they just have access to their phones all of the time. And so that kind of plays into people's kind of feelings about themselves or some of their self-esteem. Um, teen development is an interesting time. So teens are developing and what they're good at, how they want to look, how they want to dress. Um, so obviously it's a very critical time for them and social media um, and some of the, um, I guess, false impressions that are out there about um, body image, weight, appearance, um, that can really kind of play and disrupt, um, you know, some of the already risky times for teens around them understanding themselves and what they're good at, and what they want to do with their life. Um, there was also a survey conducted uh, by Girl Guides, and it showed that 59% of girls feel like they need to conform to unrealistic standards. Um, and then 55% of them said that that negatively affects their, their self-esteem. Steam, um, and even more so for those who are social media users. So that was 71%. Um, so that's just um, kind of a clear stat that helps us see that, um, you know, they they are trying to figure themselves out. Um, it is a really challenging time. And uh, if they're trying to conform to unrealistic expectations about themselves or what they look like, what they do in their life, and they can't, that's going to have an impact on um, their self-esteem. Uh, I wanted to show you something on screens and brain development. Um, I think that their kids are using screens earlier and earlier. Um, and so this is a common kind of question that we have about 
what is the impact on brain development um, and what do we need to understand about that? 98% of American homes with children now have an electronic mobile device. And on average, kids eight and under spend more than two hours a day looking at a screen. Is that too much? Or could there actually be developmental benefits to screen time? This is Your Brain On, where we explore how the world affects our brains and ourselves. Young brains need a lot of external stimuli to develop, particularly from birth to age three, what's known as the critical period. It's during this time that children's neurons are making connections for fundamental skills such as vision, hearing, and language. But these needs are based on centuries of human evolution, which used to have nothing to do with screens. Consider a child watching a video instead of listening to parents read a book. It's a far different experience for the brain. Rather than kids learning to focus and imagine the story, the device presents everything to them, so certain cognitive systems become underdeveloped. And when children spend too much time in front of a screen rather than interacting with people, they can have stunted development of the frontal lobe, part of the brain that decodes social interactions. It can become more difficult to develop empathy or learn social cues like facial expressions. What's more, the stimuli from a screen can be a lot. Colors, sounds, stories, all at a super fast pace. That can be sensory overload, releasing stress hormones such as cortisol. It can also overactivate the brain's reward systems, like the addictive hormone dopamine, getting kids used to immediate gratification they wouldn't get in the real world. So most scientists and doctors agree that screen time can alter young, still-forming brains. But in some ways, that change can be positive. Take the results of one recent study that exposed young mice six hours daily to audiovisual stimuli similar to those found in a video game. After 10 days, the mice showed signs of hyperactivity, impaired learning, and risk-taking. But the mice also stayed calm in an environment that usually would have stressed them out. Some scientists now argue screen time can help prepare a child's brain for our increasingly fast-paced, high-stimulus world. So, screen time isn't always bad, and it isn't all created equal either. An educational letter-matching game isn't the same as a violent movie. As with many things, the key is moderation. Limiting daily screen time and making sure the child can function in all of modern life. Not only with screens, but in the real world too. So you'll probably start to see a theme um, with some of what I'm sharing with you. I think that um, screen time is here to stay, um, but what's going to be really important for us as parents is figuring out how to help our kids. There's a difference between quality versus quantity, and I think that there are some benefits to our brain um, in having an increased exposure to some of the stimulus that comes with um, uh, screen use, but it's just making sure that like the video said, there's a real varied life for kids. It's not just getting all of um, their socialization or their learning from a screen, um, that they're getting it in lots of different ways too. And it's also making sure that they're using, um, you know, activities that are well balanced um, and are, are have some gains for them as well. Um, so just to go over some of the changes in brain with tech use. Um, so we know that it changes the structure of our brains. So there are researchers who uh, did some work um, and they found that frequent multimedia uh, multitasking um, can contribute to diminished gray matter um, in the interior cingulate cortex. And that's an area of the brain where attentional control resides. So what their study showed is that sometimes um, with with, and this is with tons and tons of tech use, there could be diminished gray matter. So there could be a diminished ability to uh, maintain some attentional control. Um, the other thing that some researchers have found is that technology can uh, wear out the pleasure center of your brain. So in the video, they talked about how um, it can uh, affect your cortisol levels. So that's your stress hormone, but it can also affect your dopamine uh, levels. And that's your pleasure center of your brain. Um, and so when we're taking in uh, tons of uh, material, tons of tech, where our dopamine is being overstimulated, um, it can make us less responsive to other enjoyable experiences. So maybe other enjoyable experiences that don't have as much um, glitter or excitement to them, but would have made us enjoy them um, in the past, kind of some of the simple pleasures, we may need um, lots of stimulation of dopamine to enjoy something rather than being able to enjoy simple things. 
Um, and then the other thing is there's been some research into memory. So there are some concerns or some uh, wondering about whether technology can hinder our memories. So because we are able to Google, ask Alexa, ask Siri, anything we want, um, it changes us needing to find that information, us needing to read something to understand it, us needing to talk to someone else about it. Um, so by limiting those steps, it can be limiting the impact of being able to remember that in the same way. Um, obviously, there are tons of benefits to social media uh, use or tech use. Um, so social media in particular, um, it is a way for kids to connect that's a bit separated or less organized by parents. Obviously, age plays into this. Obviously, um, you know, safety plays into this, uh, you know, so once you have some of those uh, baseline set up like kids are of a certain age where that's appropriate for them to be more independent um, in accessing their peers. Once you have it set up that it's safe um, and that who they're accessing is appropriate. Um, it is a great way for kids to have some independence in reaching out to friends and having conversations with them in arranging uh, time to be together um, because parents tend to have to do a lot of that planning. Um, and so as kids get older, it's a, it's a good way for them to um, I think parents and caregivers are also learning to slow down and tone down uh, what we do, what we look at, and we're also uh, helping our kids do that. And by that experience of helping them see kind of the risks and benefits of tech use, of what they use, um, we're helping them learn how to moderate their own technology and something that they'll need to do long into their future. Um, and then obviously, you know, the theme that I referenced before, it really is not about um, eliminating all risk or all uh, issues with technology or all use of technology, um, but it's making sure that um, we have some um, rules and some baselines um, expected for our kids that will protect them from any problems or any overuse that could be uh, an issue for them. Uh, so I wanted to show you this quick video. Um, this is just um, some information about how using our phone is changing us. And this isn't just for our kids, but this is for us as well. Of the 7 billion people on Earth, roughly 6 billion own a cell phone, which is pretty shocking given that only 4.5 billion have access to a working toilet. So how are these popular gadgets changing your body and brain? If you're looking down at your phone right now, your spine angle is equivalent to that of an eight-year-old child sitting on your neck, which is fairly significant considering people spend an average of 4.7 hours a day looking at their phone. This, combined with the length of time spent in front of computers, has led to an increase in the prevalence of myopia or nearsightedness in North America. In the 1970s, about one quarter of the population had myopia, where today nearly half do. And in some parts of Asia, 80 to 90 percent of the population is now nearsighted. And it can be hard to put your phone down. Take for example the game Candy Crush. As you play the game, you achieve small goals, causing your brain to be rewarded with little bursts of dopamine. And eventually you're rewarded in the game with new content. This novelty also gives little bursts of dopamine and together create what is known as a compulsion loop, which just happens to be the same loop responsible for the behaviors associated with nicotine or cocaine. Our brains are hardwired to make us novelty seeking, and this is why apps on our phones are designed to constantly provide us with new content, making them hard to put down. As a result, 93% of young people aged 18 to 29 report using their smartphone as a tool to avoid boredom, as opposed to other activities like like reading a book or engaging with people around them. This has created a new term, nomophobia, the fear or anxiety of being without your phone. We also see a change in brain patterns. Alpha rhythms are commonly associated with wakeful relaxation, like when your mind wanders off, whereas gamma waves are associated with conscious attentiveness. And experiments have shown that when a cell phone is transmitting, say during a phone call, the power of these alpha waves is significantly boosted, meaning phone transmissions can literally change the way your brain functions. Your smartphone can also disrupt your sleep. The screen emits a blue light, which has been shown to alter our circadian rhythms, diminishing the time spent in deep sleep, which is linked to the development of diabetes, cancer, and obesity. Studies have shown that people who read on their smartphone at night have a harder time falling asleep and produce less melatonin, a hormone responsible for the 
regulation of sleep-wake cycles. Harvard Medical School advises the last two to three hours before bed be technology-free, so pick up a book before bed instead. Of course, smartphones also completely change our ability to access information, most notably in poor and minority populations. 7% of Americans are entirely dependent on smartphones for their access to the internet. A 2014 study found that the majority of smartphone owners use their phone for online banking, to look up medical information, and searching for jobs. So while phones are in no way exclusively bad and have been part of a positive change in the world, there's no denying that they are changing us. But many successful people have now decided to take smartphone vacations in order to increase productivity. In our new ASAP Thought video, we break you should take a smartphone vacation and how it could benefit your life right now. And subscribe for more weekly science videos. I always, uh, you know, uh, have reactions when I think about a child sitting on my neck for six hours a day. Uh, there's lots of great information in that video about the science and about the impact of using our phones. And, you know, this is um, something that we as adults, we're always looking to the future and and thinking ahead for teenagers that is not their thing at all. And so I think that the more we talk to them about these things, the better chance they have to consider them. Um, but thinking about them or wondering about them or worrying about them on their own is not something developmentally that, that teens will do. Um, so I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about how we can support our kids um, directly and indirectly to get out I think that um, as kids uh, and teens, even older uh, elementary age kids, start to use um, social media or tech on their own, um, they can be exposed to difficult situations. And we won't always be there to know when they're happening. Um, so the work that we do to help them be ready um, and, and be ready to know what to do um, is really, really uh, worth it. So um, just a couple of ideas, you know, sometimes telling it like it is. So being direct, um, you know, if someone's asking them to do something or say something or post something, just being super direct about refusing to do that, um, making a joke about it. Um, so being able to make a bit of a joke about why they might not want to do that or why it might not be something that someone wants to see um, can also get them out of that situation. Um, sometimes making up an excuse. So letting our kids know that they can always use us as an excuse as parents. So my mom checks my phone, so I can't do that. Or sorry, I got to go. I have to end this conversation or even just leaving the conversation. Um, ignoring it. So there is no need for people to respond to messages, although they think that they need to. And it's kind of innately part of, um, you know, how they're responding to tech. Um, you don't have to respond to it. So you can ignore it. And if someone's asking you to do something that doesn't feel comfortable, just you, that is up to you about whether you even ever dignify that with a response. Um, standing your ground. I think helping our kids see that it's important for them to continue saying what they think or the stand that they're taking on something. Um, sometimes people can be very persuasive or pushy about it. And so kids need to know that they can stand strong about their position and they don't need to feel um, that they're doing anything wrong by taking a position, even if someone continues to ask and ask and ask them about doing what it is they want them to do, but also why they're not doing it. Obviously blocking all contact. Um, there's always the opportunity with any social media platform um, to block that person or that conversation. Um, and so spending some time with your kids, um, helping them see how they can block things if they need to, um, can be really helpful because they may need to do that. Um, and it's good for them to know how to. Um, and then reporting it. I think that um, this is something that people are not always, um, you know, great at doing or knowing how to do it. But again, taking some time to be sure you know, how do you report when someone is asking you to do something or not accepting um, your position about that um, and teaching kids how to do that and encouraging them to do that if they need to? Uh, I think that it's important to, to 
spend some time um, talking about ways to monitor and limit use. Like I've said throughout this presentation, uh, tech and social media is probably here to stay, um, but focusing on how we can monitor and limit use is probably uh, the way we need to go moving forward. Um, so obviously reducing the number of notifications. Um, I think that constantly when we're uh, signing up for anything, you know, they'll ask if we want notifications, making sure that we click no to that, making sure that every once in a while there's a bit of an inventory a notification inventory where you're looking into the notifications for all the apps and and turning that off um, keeping tech outside of the bedroom at night um, so leaving phones on a main level or giving phones to parents uh, this is something that's really good um, for us to do as well. And a lot of these um, ways to limit use, uh, it's super important for us to role model for our kids too. If they see us doing something different, um, they're going to think different about it. And so even for us as adults, leaving our phones um, downstairs, knowing that they can last um, the night and we can pick them up in the morning. Um, having technology-free zones at times of the day. Um, so making sure that you have certain times that there are no phones um, for anyone. Um, making sure that there are certain zones. Some people will decide that a living room is a, it, when people are sitting and watching TV together, it's a total screen um, free zone other than the TV screen. Um, some people will decide bedrooms are dining rooms, um, but having those spaces in your house. Um, avoiding electronic screens one or two hours before bedtime. Um, and again, not having them in our beds overnight. Uh, going on a social holiday or a social detox. Um, you know, every once in a while, um, having a bit of a vacation from your from your phone. Um, it could be a weekend, it could be a long weekend, it could be a week if people can tolerate that. Um, but just making sure that um, people can survive that and see the benefits of not having some of those micro boosts and, and some of the changes to their dopamine and their cortisol um, and what that feels like. And then promoting digital well-being. So the idea of focusing on quality um, versus quantity. Um, so um, if kids are using and if it is something that is really a part of their lives, um, it's just making sure that what they're using is quality um, and making sure that what they're using. So there's a difference between using, um, you know, Google to research something for a science project than using um, your phone to play uh, a mindless Candy Crush game. No offense to Candy Crush. Uh, but I think that it's just focusing on that and helping our kids see that, that tech is here to stay, but what we use, uh, it's great to have it fill up our cup rather than just keep our cup kind of just where it is. <laughs> Um, it's also a great idea to do a digital audit. So people probably know about Apple Screen Time or there's this really great uh, free app moment. Um, and these are ways to just, like the very first video that I showed you, get an idea of how much you're actually using um, and what you're actually spending your time on. And sometimes that can be mind blowing um, for kids also for us as well. Um, also, uh, a good idea is to create some friction during your social media use. And basically what that means is just a way to make it uh, not as easy to look at um, what you're looking at. Um, so the idea of having different steps or forcing you to take breaks or forcing you to take more steps that might make you more likely to give up and do something else. Um, so Moment, the uh, free app, has some great um, ways uh, to do that. And also Screen Time Genie. Um, these are two apps that people can use to just kind of break up their use or water it down a little bit. Um, obviously changing your app's default settings. So, um, you know, adding some notifications that make you take a break or remind you to take a break um, that remove autoplay um, so that you don't kind of have video after video after video. Um, and there's also ways to turn off likes um, so that that's just not a part of your, your screen time experience. One of the things I strongly, strongly encourage people to do is create a family media plan. I'm going to 
going to show you um, one that was created by the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics. And you can see on the screen, this is just uh, one example um, of a section of it. But you'll see on the top, um, they have you um, list kind of who's in your family, what your prior priorities are as a family, what kind of things you're involved with, how you use your screen time. They ask you to create a media balance. So how do you kind of want that balance of media use to be? They uh, have sections where you can highlight um, some media topics that you want to discuss as a family, um, and you know it will give you ideas of how to. Um, it'll talk about um, some digital privacy and safety, so different, um, uh, I guess, hotspots or concerns. Um, and you can see on the screen, this gives an example of what in any of these topics, what it looks like. So there will be, um, you know, a, a, an agenda or, or a line of what you might want to talk about or or um, have conversations about. There'll be some information about why that's important and then also how it'll give you some suggestions of ways that you could do that. So the one you see on the screen is screen free zones. So uh, the example they have there is um, choosing if you just decide to keep meal screen free, why you would do that and how you could do that. There's also information about choosing good content, how to help kids do that, um, and then also using media together. So all of these different steps will help you come up with um, an amazing family media plan that you can follow. Um, some steps, some tips, a baseline for each other, and you can review that, print that, have that kind of in your home. It's just a way for everybody to ground themselves and be kind of on the same page about media use, what's important, and, and how to navigate it. Um, I wanted to show you a quick video. Uh, these are some teens who were, were asked to give up uh, social media for a week. So they were forced to take a uh, social uh, media vacation and, and here's how it went for them. Now to our social experiment of what happens when a group of teens are challenged to unplug, giving up social media, online games, and going offline for an entire week. Lindsay Janice is here with the very brave test and the results. Good morning, Lindsay. I'm really glad I wasn't living with one of these teens forced to give up their phone. This experiment was conducted by a parenting website designed to monitor how these kids were feeling every step of the way during their digital detox, many of them revealing just how attached they are to their phones. I think like 90% of my friendships like rely on my phone. I use my phone a lot as a stress relief. We're going to ask each of you to give up all the fun stuff on your phone for one whole week. I don't like it. She knows media challenged 10 New York City teens to disconnect digitally for seven days. No social media, no streaming videos, and no texting. Your parents have all signed off on this. How does that make you feel now? Betrayed. Stressed. Nervous. When you talk about withdrawal, you look at various levels of it. So I think at one end of the spectrum, uh, the kids who are very used to it were a little anxious, a little twitchy. And then at the other end of the spectrum is if you take it away completely, does it make somebody physically anxious? Do you see them sweating? Does their heart race? During the week, they reported on the... One of those nights where I'm just like, I need my phone. I need it, I need it, I need it. So I, I constructed myself this. It's my fake phone. Um, it's actually much nicer because when we're hanging out, we're not on our phones as much. At the end of the seven days, the moment of truth. I slipped up one time, I think, and it was texting my sister. Friday, I sent a video to my friend on Snapchat, and then I was like, oh, shoot, and then she replied, and I didn't check it. But how did giving up all that screen time make them feel? Refreshed. Relieved. Calm. Good. Just doing this digital detox is showing me how much I use social media, and I haven't really thought about how much I use it until I don't have it anymore. Henry confessing he felt stressed because his phone helps him unwind. This week, Henry did slip up. I logged into my YouTube. I would by no means call it a fail. It was a challenge, and a challenge is not supposed to be easy. JoJo says she found herself doing things she once loved to do again. She wasn't distracted. She listened to music. She spent more time with us. I really enjoyed it. Psychiatrist Greg Dillon says the amount of screen time matters, but even more important are the activities kids engage in and how it impacts their mood. If you watch your kids and talk to them and slow it down and understand what they're using it for, then it can be 
perfectly healthy and normal. So for all the anxiety the experiment initially created, most of the kids said they would now consider voluntarily giving up some screen time. And, and when they were asked who they would challenge to do a digital detox next, they all said their parents would be up to doing it. They didn't think they could do it. It might be harder for the parents than the kids. My twins turned 13 on Saturday. Daddy's got a birthday present for you. I'm taking the phone. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. <laughs> well, hey there, GMA fans. Now so I think uh, a social media detox is such a great idea for everyone in our homes. I think that um, in that video, you can see those kids felt better. And uh, that is their true opinion about what it felt like to not have their phones. I think there's a lot of pressure to have a phone, to be on a phone, to be using a phone. And when we force um, a social media detox or a phone detox, um, it can really help people see um, some of the other things that they like to do and how great it can feel with some of those biological changes, um, you know, more balanced. Um, and I think it's a really cool thing that we might see too. So um, here are some resources for children and teens. Um, Kids Help Phone has a great uh, section on social media and uh, tech safety. Um, so how kids can understand it, some of the common things that they may um, be exposed to and how they can manage it. Um, that's uh, not cool. Ca. That's another um, site where kids can go to do some more interactive activity. It's more based for teens um, on relationship safety, on online relationship safety. And so it kind of works them through different activities and gives some scenarios for them to learn from. Um, the rest of the resources that you see on the screen, so Be Internet Awesome, Cloud Quest, Safe Online Surfing, and Band Runner, those are all um, interactive, uh, I guess, activities, games um, to help kids learn how to be safe online. Um, and so Safe Online Surfing has different age groups. So they have um, by grade, so they have for younger kids, and then they also have for older kids. Um, but it's really all about making it fun for them, making making it interactive for them so that they can learn about um, their use, how to be safe with it, and how to use it well. Um, and so those are some great resources um, for kids and teens. And then as parents, um, here are some really super resources um, for us. Um, so Media Smarts, um, so that's a, a phenomenal resource um, that really gives lots of information to parents about uh, different uh, types of technology, different ways for us to navigate that different technology, how to understand it, how to put uh, different um, safety precautions in place for kids, um, all up to date, um, lots of information for parents that really help us understand the tech that our kids are using um, and how to navigate it. Um, and same with Common Sense Media, um, lots of, of really great practical um, updated information for us. Um, Protect Kids Online is similar. So um, all of these on your screen will give you lots of information about navigating different social media platforms, but also ways that you can talk to your kids about being safe online um, and ways that you can introduce um, different um, plans as a family to, to focus on quality and not quantity of tech use. Um, so that's all that I have for you. I hope that uh, this has been helpful for you. I hope that the message about um, focusing on quality and not quantity and knowing that um, social media and tech use is here to stay, um, but we can uh, help our kids um, navigate it safely. Um, I hope that message was clear and helpful to you. Thank you uh, for taking the time.